Hi, everybody. I'm glad you all made it out. I know the snow was deep, but it's nice you all made the effort. And um, welcome back to the Grange for our 2023 season with the Bridgewater Historical Society. All right, 24. Okay. Yes, it was fun last year. It's going to be fun this year. Okay, 2024 season. Uh, a couple of points to bring up. There's a fire exit at each end of the building. And uh, we can plan on refreshments and question and answer period after the talk. So save all the excitement for when he gets done talking. <laughs> um, the other minor thing is we have a new website, which we've been encouraging everybody to access and to enjoy, especially for the photos and the stories. But we had a little problem over the weekend. So maybe you want to wait till the end of the week. They're working on fixing the glitches. And uh, on to the topic. Uh, we'd, I'd like to welcome our guest, Howard Coffin. We all know that he's a top-notch Civil War historian, having written many terrific books on world um, Civil War. I also learned recently of his autograph collection and the fun stories behind each one. But since our last event with, with Howard in 2023, there is a new and improved Howard Coffin. He now arrives with an honorary doctorate from Northern Vermont State University. Will you take care of me for free? <laughs> It'd be a big job. I would think so. Much like the straw man in The Wizard of Oz, there was a gap in his career that has been filled with this degree. He is now legitimate in the eyes of academia. <laughs> this legitimate speaker will address the author, Barry Fell, and the subject of cairns and stone structures in Vermont. Barry wrote books on the subject in the 70s and 80s, and Howard visited these sites with Barry and wrote articles on Barry's research. So now I will turn it over to our legitimate historian, Howard Clark. <laughs> Well, I thought the Civil War was popular. My goodness. Uh, just a, a word on the honorary degree, which I got two weeks ago. Two weeks ago today, uh, I went to Linden State Teachers College. And I lasted two and a half years. And then two awful things happened to me. My girlfriend broke up with me. A Woodstock girl. <laughs> Probably a lot of you know her, uh, knew her. And then there was uh, my first hour of practice teaching. The subject was Abraham Lincoln. And I knew something about Lincoln, but the, the supervisory teacher in the back of the room, Esther Buzzle, would not let me deviate one word from the damn lesson plan. That night, I had a couple of beers packed my cardboard suitcase, went out on Route 5 in the middle of Lindenville. It was 20 below at 10 o'clock and stuck out my thumb. That ended my college career forever. And I never got a degree until two weeks ago. And it was a damn doctorate. <laughs> my twin brother, Bruce, who has four degrees, I think, was sitting, he, I mean, he really worked for him, was sitting beside me, but he never got a doctorate. <laughs> okay, we've got a hot topic today. I knew there'd be a crowd for this. And I will beg you, there will probably be those who do not agree with me. Uh, but wait until the question and answer uh, session uh, to, to agree, and, agree and disagree, and I'll stay as long as anybody wants to talk about this topic. And it's a long time ago, and I hope my memory is good. It's fair. <laughs> One late summer night in 1975, having filed a couple of stories and about to leave for home, I was in the Rutland Herald newsroom browsing the Boston Globe. And a tiny two-paragraph story caught my eye. It said a Harvard professor was claiming that New England had been settled by people who crossed the Atlantic Ocean about the time that Christ walked the earth. 
and he had found evidence in ancient stone structures in southern New Hampshire and Vermont. I showed the story to Ken Weil, the managing editor of the Rutland Herald, and I said I'd like to go after it, and he, he, he was pretty skeptical. But he said, if you want to try it, go ahead. He said, I think it'll be an interesting story. I was then the state reporter for the Rutland Herald, the first one they'd ever had, and I could wander wherever I wanted to. And uh, so uh, anyway, the, uh, a couple of days later, I phoned Harvard and tracked down Professor Barry Fell. Yes, he said. Megalithic structures he had discovered in Vermont and ancient writings had convinced him that Celts, even Phoenicians and Egyptians, had been in New England more than 2,000 years ago. They had left stone buildings, standing stones, even writing and art. Where were these things? Fell said he didn't dare give away any exact locations for fear of vandalism, which I thought was fair. By the way, uh, he told me to call him Barry. His, his name, his full name, H. Barraclough Fell. <laughs> Barraclough Fell. Only last night, when I was futzing around on the internet, did I find out H. Barraclough Fell, what the H stood for. Howard. <laughs> you wait. <laughs> No, he wouldn't give away any locations, fearing vandalism. He said perhaps the most interesting Vermont site was in the hills bordering the Connecticut Valley in southern Vermont. He had given it the name Calendar Two for research purposes. The alignment of certain stones and structures there seemed to reveal that it was once used for observing the heavens, perhaps to foretell the seasons. I asked the professor to further describe the place. He said, yeah, I was writing a little preview of this. He proceeded to talk of a hilltop with a stone platform, ceremonial altar, and a large underground stone chamber. I interrupted. That's Moon's Arch in South Woodstock. <laughs> he said, you know. And I said, damn right I do. We used to party there. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, you can't tell anybody. I said, I won't. I said, I'll keep it a secret. I, and I, he said, what did you call it? I said, Moon's Arch. He said, aha. <laughs> that must be from the Celtic. The Arch of the Moon. You see, they had a ceremonial altar there for studying that, for watching the heavens. I said, no, Owen Moon owned the property and he built an arch up there. <laughs> that should have been a real red flag for me. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, he didn't pay much attention to that. I said, no, I won't tell anybody. So. And we did have some parties up there. <laughs> My mother and father had partied there. And when I worked at the Woodstock Inn, I was a bellhop there, the last bell captain at the old Woodstock Inn. We had our summer parties up there, and oh my God, we had it. And if it rained, we went in the stone chamber. <laughs> big, it was a big, big, uh, how big was it? Uh, quarter of this, no. Fifth the size of this room, maybe, yeah. Anyway, so. Undaunted by my explanation, Fell said he would meet me in Woodstock the next week and show me his discoveries. He said he was also writing a book. Celts living in Portugal had come to America via the Canary Islands, he told me, settled there and built temples. The temples resembled in some ways Stonehenge. The Celts settled Britain after Portugal, but only after they had come to America, he said. The sites included boulders up to five tons. Farmers had incorporated some of the stones into stone walls. 
and he had found Celtic language on the rocks. Also, they found the origins in the writings of such family names as McGavin and Ewan. And he said at some time the Celts had come up the Connecticut River and branched off up the Ottaquichi as far as a gorge. And from there they had moved overland and settled the valleys, the upland valleys. That's what he said. What did I know about megalithic structures? Well, I had been in England in the summer of 1960, and I had spent much of the summer in Kent, uh, near, the, near the city of Maidstone. And I can't, I'll never forget uh, being on the train, coming from London to Maidstone, and somebody pointed out the window at a stone ruin up on the hillside called Kit's Cody House. Anybody ever seen it? Big pile of stones is what it looked like. But it was four or 5,000 years old, apparently. And I never forgot that. It was, you know, so anyway, I'd seen a megalithic structure. And then in, uh, in 1960, I had seen these great chalk carvings on the hillsides of England, you know, three or 400 feet, you know, some of them in, in width, amazing. Well, I checked in the fell in the intervening days between, I mean, this stuff he told me later on, but I'm just using it as background. I checked in the fell and found that he was indeed a professor at Harvard, but not a professor of archaeology, a noted professor of mar marine biology. <laughs> and he had a very solid reputation in that field. We met in South Woodstock at the comfortable home of a Woodstock family located in the South Woodstock Hills, not far from what he called Calendar 2, or Moon's Arch. <laughs> and they, these people, uh, these people did, did not eschew publicity. So I'm gonna use their names today. And you know, they, uh, especially Mrs. became a very uh, strong supporter of Fell, and I think supported his work. Name was Sincerbo. That's a familiar name, I'm sure, to quite a few people. Do you, was it Betty? Was that her name? Yes. yes. Who said that? Yes. I, that's what I thought. Yeah. I know her husband was Bob. Yeah. And he and I were involved in a couple of preservation projects uh, years later. Fell, uh, I found to be a seemingly pleasant fellow, 60-ish, kind of tousled hair with a very distinct English accent. And I found out that he had grown up in Sussex. I'll pass this around. It's just a poor copy of a Rutland Herald article that I wrote, or part of it. But there's a picture, a good picture of Fell on the, on the, on the, on the, on the cover there. It's a, that's a good likeness of him. Uh, at Calendar 2, we, we went uh, out to Calendar 2. Now, uh, Calendar 2 at Moon's Arch. Drive to South Woodstock and go to the old country school or the, or the horse association, right? And there's that sharp turn where the, where the road goes perilously to the right. Don't turn, go straight. <laughs> <laughs> to the top of the hill, to the ridge, and up there is Calendar 2. And if you look off to the left, you'll see a great stone chamber. The last time I went there, it was closed off. The owners, it appeared to me, I haven't been there for several years, it looked like they had shut it down. I'm, I'm sure it got a tremendous amount of attention. And uh, uh, I used to, you know, I... After all this, people would call me up and want me to give a tour, you know, take them to these places. I did for a few people. I should have made some money off it. You know, I, I used to do Civil War tours. But, uh, so I was looking at Moon's Arch from a different perspective. Here is uh, here's the road from South Woodstock. Here is uh, the uh, underground structure. Up over here is the fireplace, the arch. And there's a couple of low ridges in here where there are strange markings. 
up on top of the hill there was a stone platform with a roof over it. It was a picnic place. And that's where we used to, that's where we used to party. And then out in the field there was a strange flat stone with all kinds of markings on it out here. But that was what he called Calendar 2 and what we call Moon's Arch. That was Moon's Arch right there. It was a fireplace, an arched fireplace. We, uh, near the, uh, we, we went inside the Calendar 1 and he pointed up to the roof. Now I'd been in that thing a hundred times. You know, uh, in, when we partied there, we'd build a fire if it was a cold night, you know. There was a hole in the roof, a stone hole had been arranged for a hole in the roof. And, but I had never really looked at the ceiling. And the stones of that ceiling are huge. I mean, they're this wide and this thick. And they must be, what, 25 feet long, 30 feet long? I mean, I had never looked at that before. And I was just awestruck. And, and uh, I thought, wow, you know? And uh, then we walked over to the arch, and Fell began running a finger along one of the stones where there was a clear along a, a marking that, with, with other markings branching off it. And, 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 and Fell read it. He said, this is Ogham. This is Celtic writing. And he read, the great god Wow. I was impressed. <laughs> and also close by the ogham was a stone with a hole in it. And there were two slender stones near it. And he said that this was a, a, an altar where young men went through the, the rite of manhood. Those were phallic symbols, the stones. Uh, then we went up to the picnic shelter that was on this stone platform, and he said that is where, that was the observatory where they observed the stars, and it was right on the top of a hill. And then he took me to this strange stone out in the field, and it was like almost squares, I remember, and there were, stone, there were marks like this, almost perfect. Uh, rectangles. And he said he hadn't figured out yet what it said, but it was clearly some kind of writing. And I got the suspicion then uh, that it might be plow marks. <laughs> I didn't say anything. I just listened, you know. <laughs> when, we, when we were driving back later on, we were driving back to Woodstock, we were going along Kedron Brook, you know. Not far uh, from, from, from South Woodstock, the road goes downhill. And he pointed off to Kedron Brook, and there, and there were, uh, the, the, the brook comes down in sort of steps. And he said he was convinced that those big stones for calendar one had been taken out of that brook. And that's why those steps were like they were. Anyway, possible, you know. I mean, he'd done some work. He'd done some homework. I suppose it was three miles from there to Calendar 2 or Moon's Arch. It would have been a long haul uphill. And then he took me, we're getting a little out of sequence here, but after we finished it at Moon's Arch, we went, and it's been a long time, but we went across the road up into this area where there was a ridge top. I suppose vertically it might have been 150 feet higher than this area. And he said that this was a marriage altar. And it was half the size of this room at the most, maybe a third of the size of this room. And there were phallic stones around the edge. And in the middle there were two little depressions. that he said were the places where the bride and groom sat during the marriage ceremony. And I sat down at it, and my bony seat fit perfectly. <coughs> it really did look like that was what it was.
there was more, there'll be more to this. After going to the wedding altar, we went, we continued on this road down the hill. And on the left, and it's still there, is a huge stone. A uh, stone uh, almost as big as this space right here. I would, my memory tells me. And it's somehow tilted so it sta almost stands up. Now that sure looked megalithic to me. And, and Fell said that it was probably a roof stone of one of the, of the chambers uh, that had been destroyed over the years. I don't know, but it's still there. And if you drive that road, you'll see it on the left. Uh, and then we went down to the bottom of a hill, maybe a mile or something like that. And there's a road that goes off this way to Heartland, I think. I've forgotten those roads. Uh, beg pardon? Jennyville. Oh, Jennyville. OK, maybe. Uh, the roads, this road keeps going, and then the road. And there was a big house right here. I think it might have been stone. I don't know. A mansion, almost. And fell. <laughs> never forget, he walked right up to the door and knocked on the door. And this lady o opened the door. I suppose she was 70-ish. Very distinguished-looking lady. Even formidable, I would say. <laughs> and fell said to her, uh, excuse me, she, he said, but uh, you have a stone structure in your... In, uh, up on the hill here on your property that was built more than 2,000 years ago. And she looked at him and she said, really? <laughs> and he said, yes, you probably don't know that. But he said, it's probably Celtic in origin. And she said, really? <laughs> she was just so controlled, it was amazing. And he said, would you mind if I took this gentleman to see it? He, she said, not a bit. And so we went up, and here was this, uh, this stone structure. Oh, I, I would say it was about this wide. And the, the entryway, you know, calendars to the entryway is this high. You know, you can walk right into it. But this one had a stone across the entrance there. Whoops. And, uh, and you had to duck way down to get into it. As a matter of fact, I remember now, we had to go around the back side of it in here. That's right. So we got into this thing, and you know, you had to scrunch down. And lo and behold, Fell shined a flashlight on the roof, and there was a carving up there, or a painting. I don't know what to say. I'm not an artist. It, it was about the size of about a little bigger than this. And it was like it was like a Thunderbird. And there it was, right there. And he said, that is some kind of a ceremonial figure. I said, it looks like a Thunderbird. He said, it may be. And he said, it's Phoenician. Well, that really, that was quite a thrill to see that thing. Uh, that pretty much ended our first day together. Uh, the next day, Phil took me, uh, Phil took me to Pomfret, which is my mother's ancestral home, Jilson family, and showed me some more, a couple of more stone, small stone structures, which of course we call root cellar. I mean, Vermonters call them root cellars. And uh, we then went over to Royalton and uh, to uh, Sharon. And uh, stopped the car and went out into a farmer's field. And there was a mound in the farmer's field. And there was a small entrance. That high, that wide, perhaps. And Bell crawled in, and I followed him in, and he had a flashlight, and, and we shined it around, you know. And uh, now, Fell Bell was a genius. 
and he said, do you know, Mr. Coffin, that we are on the Joseph Smith farm? And I said, no. And he said, yes, Joseph Smith uh, lived here on this farm. And surely he knew about this structure. And surely he had been in it as a boy. And of course, the family moved to New York State, to Palmyra, where uh, Smith would claim that he found uh, Celtic tablets, golden tablets, that were the basis for the book of Mormon, or the Church of Latter-day Saints, as I'm told to say it. And he said, you know, when he got to Palmyra, having known this structure, he, when he saw another one out there, he knew what it was. And he crawled in, and there was the tablets. That's a damn good idea, you know? <laughs> I mean, really. Fell uh, really, he fascinated me by that one. I mean, who knows? Uh, Fell also had found, I don't know, I still don't understand how he found all these places. And uh, he must have been roaming around years before I found out about it. Uh, he also uh, was aware of, he, and had been to Oliver's Cave. How many of you know Oliver's Cave? Okay, not many. All right, in the hills of, west of uh, uh, East Barnard, there is a cave and a stone structure that I understand the, the hut to have been built by a man named Oliver Plaisted in 1862. He lived in East Barnard, and he fled to the hills when the Civil War began to avoid the draft. And he lived in a cave the first winter. Cave is, this cave, of course, is still there. And there are stones that he put up to sh shield the side of it. It's about seven feet long and maybe this high. Must have been a hell of a winter. And then he, and then, as we understand it, he got a railroad jack and went to walk to Woodstock, which is a dozen miles, and to get his supplies. He walked back and forth. He didn't have a horse. And with that railroad jack, he built himself a stone hut and, uh, and spent the Civil War there. And they left him alone, and when the war ended, he came back down and lived for a while in the, in, back in East Barnard. I think it was kind of wacky. The, the people left him alone, you know, I mean. Uh, and I've led tours. I led tours for years up to that up to that place, the cave and the structure. But Fell, you know, I, of course, I'd been there before, but Fell pointed to the roof stone, which I had never paid much attention to. It's huge. I mean, you know, it's from me to that tablet over there, and it's, you know, about as wide. And he raised it with a railroad jack. Maybe he did. I don't know, but it, it's, it's massive. I'd never noticed that before. Never paid any attention to it. Well, <laughs> based on those two days with Fell, uh, I wrote a long story for the Rutland Herald, which ran on page one, explaining what Fell believed and what he had shown me. And uh, Fell called me and thanked me. And I said, uh, I said, Mr. Fell, I'm going to, or Professor Fell, I guess I called him, I'm going to call archaeologists and see what they think. And he said, I wish you would do that. <laughs> well, listen, I'm a newspaper man, first and foremost. And that's what newspaper people do. And Kendall Wilde was one of the great newspaper, and probably the best newspaper editor in the history of Vermont. And if I hadn't gone for the other side, he would have fired me. And, uh, and I wanted to. Let's find out what's going on here. So I got on the phone for a couple of days, and did I ever. And I'm going to quote you some of the responses that I got from describing all this. 
And quite a few archaeologists were familiar with Fell's work, and apparently he had published some papers, I guess. Uh, one of his strong supporters was a professor at Castleton named Warren Cook. And I got to know Cook, and I liked him. He was a pleasant person, although we later had some difficulties. He, he really believed everything that, the, the, just about everything that Fell said. Uh, Fell told me on the phone, Fell should be, uh, excuse me, Cook told me, Fell should be complimented on his courage. He's a brave man up against the establishment. And, and, and Fell noted that, 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 and I forgot to mention this, that, that he and Fell uh, had really gotten a lot of information from a place called Mystery Hill in New Hampshire, which is, I think, down near Manchester. I've never been there. Uh, but it's a massive stone uh, site with various structures, apparently. Apparently, it's absolutely beguiling. I, I wish I'd gone there, but I'll, I'll talk to, about that later. Now, Professor Warren Cowgill of the Yale Graduate School. Uh, what what uh, you're describing sounds like Ogham to me. Uh, you see, he seems to have found something he said. Uh, but he said Ogham has never been found on this side of the Atlantic. Okay, the director of Harvard's Peabody Museum. Professor Stephen Williams. Fell is an amateur in the field he is pursuing. He is a professor of invertebrate zoology. I've been to Mystery Hill. I have never been convinced of anything earlier than colonial date in any of the construction there. Professor Elmer Harp, head of Dartmouth's uh, anthropology department. I am an extreme skeptic about all this. I've heard about what he's claiming. I went to Mystery Hill. There was nothing to indicate Celtic, Norse, or Irish settlement. Why should Europeans penetrate all the way to the hills of Vermont to settle? If these are Celtic remains, they should be traceable in a claim to the coast, in, in, in a chain to the coast. Root cellars are perfectly logical, things to find. The settlers needed them to store food. Howard Sargent, anthropologist in Georges Mills, New Hampshire, editor of an anthro, uh, uh, anthro, uh, archaeology uh, uh, magazine. I've never seen any evidence of early settlement, uh, even at Mystery Hill. My big question was with, with such a large human population as he's claiming, uh, where are the traces of the settlements themselves? Why just the temples? Okay. So, and, and, and I talked to several more. I mean, I went to the top, you know. These are, these are big deal people. And I published a front page story, which, you know, Cook was supportive of, but basically, whoa, you know, uh, he came up against it. Well. Now, I quickly heard that Fell was furious with me. But I called him to get a quote from him. I said, have you read my second article? Yes. And what do you think? And then he had a, a very, he, he spoke in very measured tones. He clearly was furious. Uh, but this is no fool. And he said, you know, if these people, these professionals, side with me, it destroys all of their research and all of the archaeological research of this area done for years and years and years. Their careers rest on the, on the story that they've all bought into, which isn't true. Fell never spoke to me again. <laughs> never. But that's okay. I'm a newspaper man. I'm used to that, you know. <laughs> Not long after he went silent, my twin brother and I were walking up on Mount Tom in Woodstock. 
up near Pogue Hole. How many of you know Mount Tom? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, the high point on Mount Tom is North Ridge, which is up above, looks down on Pogue Hole. Yeah. And who should we meet? Well, I mean, my life has been like this. I, I always have this luck, you know. We met Betty Sinzerbaum <laughs> coming down from North Ridge, and she was pretty cold to me, you know. <laughs> She'd been talking to Barry. But I said, hello, Mrs. Sensorbo, and she said, hello. And as she passed by us, she said, go to the highest point. There's a standing stone up there. Well, Bruce and I hustled up the, to the top of the hill, and by God, there was. It was only about this high, but it was a standing stone. Now, it looked to me like a stone. You know when trees fall, sometimes they pull stones up, you know? That's what it looked like to me but it was evenly shaped and there was a standing stone on the high point of Mount Tom. Anyway. And 20 years ago I went to Ireland for 10 days. And, the, and I went to Kilchema in the west for the annual St. Patrick's Parade. One of my best friend's brother is a mummer, and his band was in the parade in Kiljama, the biggest parade in the West. A town of 2,500 people with 50 bars. <laughs> I was happy as could be. I've been six years without a drink, damn it. Uh, the word got around that I was a writer in, in Kilchema. And one afternoon, the mayor took me out to see a 100-year-old woman who was the expert on history. And she spent an afternoon telling me about banshees and fairy forts and hill forts. And she liked me. And she said, never go to a fairy fort after dark. You know, these things are all over Ireland. And she'd be, she said, be careful after dark around the standing stones. I remember before I left her, I loved that woman. We sat by a little peat fire. And I said, have you ever seen a banshee? And she was silent for a moment. And she said, no, but my mother knew a woman who knew a woman who heard one. <laughs> God, he was, he, she was wonderful. One afternoon, my brother and I uh, went over to Sharon, and, uh, and I wanted to show him that uh, structure on the, the old Smith farm. And we stopped at Brooksy's Diner. Now, who remembers Brooksy's Diner? What a great restaurant. Brooksy was about this big. A lovely person. Oh, that was a great place to eat. Building still there? I think so. Oh, I guess it's gone, yeah. And lo and behold, who walks into the restaurant but one of Feld's best friends, Byron Dix, from Newport, Vermont. And Dix was a co-researcher with, with Feld. And he was a strong believer in Mystery Hill. And Dix had somebody with him. I don't remember who it was. And Dix uh, was an amateur astrologer and ar ar archaeologist. He was very, he, I mean, this is well after my second article came out, and he's just as pleasant as could be. That's the way to treat the press, you know? <laughs> I was a PR guy for years, and, uh, you know, Fell made a big mistake, but I can understand. But, but Dix was just as sweet as could be. And he, uh, that day, he showed us a, an underground structure, and I don't remember where. I think it was on Howe Hill. How Hill connects Sharon with uh, North Pomfret. And I know where there's a small uh, underground structure there. Uh, but Dix was just as nice as could be. And he told us quite a lot about uh, uh, Mystery Hill. And then he told us about a valley he had discovered near Sharon that he called the Non-Known Valley. <laughs> what a great name. Okay. <laughs> Boy, you know, I perked up instantly, and he said, you know, he had invented this machine 
that would take readings of where the, you could set it somewhere and it would tell you where the sun would rise on a given day. It worked. I mean, it was clever. And he had found this valley in the hills up above Sharon somewhere, and he determined that there was a, uh, the center of the place was right in the middle of the valley, and there were things on the horizon. There were hills all around, and there were stones and, uh, you know, dips in the horizon and so forth that if you stood down there at the central location, which was marked by stones, I never went there. By stones, I guess, you know, you could, on, on certain significant days, the sun rose over those stones. It was a big, it was like a stone hedge with smaller stones, you know, in a huge area. He pointed to me how to get there. He showed me where it was. I never went there. I have to tell you, you know, I was a reporter. And this story, when it ends, you go on to another, although well, this one didn't end. <laughs> Not quite. I never went to the unknown valley, but I thought it was one of the wonderful names I ever heard. He also told me that the chamber in South Woodstock at, at Moon's Arch on the vernal equinox, right? Is that right? The sun comes directly in the door that day. So he was absolutely convinced that it was a celestial observatory. Winter solstice. Winter solstice. What, what did I say? You said equinox. It's the, it's the solstice. I, see, I'm no expert. <laughs> anyway, on that longest day in the is you? That, yeah. Oh, thank you. You aren't Byron Dix, are you? <laughs> uh, uh, I'm trying here. Uh, that that the sun comes right in there, and it you know it faces south. Yeah. And uh, oh, wow. Uh, it was a pleasant uh, time we spent with him, and and of course he pointed out that there are beehive huts along the White River Valley. I've never seen them, but those are you know, built as are the beehive huts in the British Isles and so forth, you know. Uh, but I, I don't know where they are. And I, so there's something going on over there. <laughs> well, a few weeks went by and the phone rang one day. I lived in North Shrewsbury, by the way. Uh, I was married then, my first wife. And uh, it was National Geographic calling. And they understood that I'd done some writing on what was Fell was claiming. And they were doing an article, just happened to be doing an article on the Celts. And they wanted to see the wedding altar and calendar two. Would I meet them over there? Yes. Do you have a wife or girlfriend? Yes. Bring her, please. <laughs> so we met him over there at the uh, Moon's Arch and showed them what we, you know, knew, and uh, they took pictures every year. He, see, they were finishing up this article on the Celts, and they'd heard about what Fell was claiming, and so they wanted to make sure it wasn't something they were, were going to miss. They didn't want to be behind the game. So they sent a team up. They sent two reporters and a photographer, and then they said, where is the wedding altar? And so I took them up there, and <laughs> They had my wife and me sit in the little depressions, and they took all kinds of pictures, even some close-ups of our butts. <laughs> we had visions of being famous, or at least our butts. <laughs> anyway, uh, they finally decided after taking all those pictures, a day's worth of pictures, that they did not agree with Fell, and they did not change their article. Now, in 1977, the state of Vermont hired a state archaeologist for the first time, Giovanna Neudorfer. Now, I had later knew her mother, who was a professor at UVM, an expert in maple syrup. Can't remember her name was Newdorfer. Can't remember her name. Tough lady. You anybody know it? I don't know. Uh, anyway, uh, and Giovanna was tough, young, 
and attractive woman. And uh, she later got married, uh, Giovanna Peebles was her name. And because, now a clamor had arisen in Vermont over all this. I mean, Fell had a lot of followers. They wanted to believe this kind of thing, especially in the, this area. You know, people were, were listening to him, and, and, and they were very interested. And so G, people, now that G, once Giovanna took office, every, the phone didn't stop ringing. What about these stone structures, you know? What's going on here, you know? Go over there. And so she undertook a re, to do a report in early 1977, or early summer of 77. And she published her report in early fall and uh, basically said she basically didn't agree with what he was saying. Although she said there were a couple of things that she couldn't explain. But she, the key, one of the keys in her report was no carbon-14 dating had been done. And some had been tried, apparently, at calendar two, and nothing old had been found. So she said, In mid-1977, Professor Warren Cook hosted a conference at Castleton, a two-day conference at Castleton on these stone structures. It was a sellout. 500 people packed the auditorium both days. I wasn't there. By then, I was the chief political reporter of the Rutland Herald, and there was some kind of a political conference, I don't remember, going on, and so I was barred from it by the managing editor, who wanted to be there himself. <laughs> and he was a total disbeliever, and Kendall Wilde was a brilliant man. He was a Harvard graduate, he was just absolutely, and tough as nails. No, Coffin, you're not going. What are you going to do? He took a young reporter named Harry Jaffe, uh, who later became uh, 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 Pat Leahy's press secretary. <laughs> Every day, the Rutland Herald editorial page, down the left-hand side, had three editorials. The managing editor often wrote one. The publisher of the Herald often wrote one, and then, you know, three opinion pieces. Damn good stuff. The morning the conference opened, Kendall Wilde took over the editorial page and asked to have the lead editorial and was given it by the owner of the paper. This is what the editorial page looked like. I'm going to enlarge this. You guys can't see, can you? This is what it looks like. Oh, good. Kendall Wilde drew a line and branched off, and that's just what Fell's Celtic Ogham looked like on the rocks in Calendar One. It was a shot right at Fell. Oh, my God. It was clever. It was clever. The Fell supporters didn't laugh, but the Wild was tough as nails. He didn't care. Uh, they had experts from everywhere at that conference, even from England. And it was, it was, uh, it was a beautiful, I wished I'd been there. Let me just see what, uh, here's, here's Wild's story, a little bit of it. For almost two hours Friday night, the professor emeritus, that's Fell, he had retired from Harvard, addressed the audience using a lengthy series of slides. Fell told the European and North, of North, European and North African con contacts in North and South America. He told the Phoenician cities in Ohio, showed slides of ancient artifacts found in New York, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, underground chambers in New York State, Vermont. Fell's rapid fire presentation was filled with astounding claims. The applause was deafening. Giovanna Neudorfer, the archaeologist, state archaeologist, 
I cannot even say that the script I saw is anything other than wear and tear from nature. <laughs> the British experts uh, did not agree that this was anything Celtic. But it was quite a to-do. And it was page one. Well, interestingly, Kendall Weil said after the conference, he didn't write this, he said it to me, he said, Fell has a theory that he is finding facts to apply to instead of the other way around. Now that's a very interesting commentary. Newspaper reporting has been called the first draft of history. I learned my reporting from some of the best, including Kendall Wilde. I, with Fell, I did what my job uh, was described as doing. I, I, I reported what he said, and then I asked other experts. Fell's defense was very interesting, saying, you know, that we were threatening the livelihoods of an awful lot of archaeologists. Today, people search the hills of Callus. Barry, where they say they're seeing signs of big creatures. The great mystery today seems to be the UFOs or UAPs. It's fascinating stuff. There's something there. I heard the I learned the other night that when Clinton was president, Lawrence Rockefeller asked for a meeting. And he demanded of Clinton that he release all the information that the government has on extraterrestrials. And Clinton astonished Rockefeller by saying, no. You don't say no to Rockefeller. <laughs> wow. Now, my hairdresser, <laughs> my hair cutter, a lot of you probably know her. Carol, uh, Carol, uh, what was her name? Carol. Linda Carol. Carol. Carol Merrill, yes. Well, what was her uh, uh, maiden name? Gilbert. Yes, okay. <laughs> She's a Woodstock girl. And I told her this story the day before yesterday when she cut my hair. And she said, wow. When I, she lived over near Rockefeller. And she said, several nights when I was a kid, my bedroom window faced right up toward the mansion. I saw strange lights in the sky several times. <laughs> Wow! <laughs> Maybe that's what got Lawrence down to Washington. <laughs> wow. Down the years, I have recalled time and again the stone chambers. Controversy, and it was a controversy. The only story in the history of the Herald that got more letters to the editor was the one I talked about a year ago, which was about the side hill croncher. <laughs> the weird animals that run the hills up here, part boar and part deer. <laughs> That's true. Oh my God, everybody had a, a, a belief in this. Vilas Bridges was the best, though. Who? Vilas Bridge. Oh, Vilas Bridge, OK. <laughs> I do know that some of the things that I saw have not been explained. There really did appear to be writing on the stones of uh, some places, although I've read things that say that it's natural wearing of the stones. I don't know, cracking of the stone. The, the roof stones, uh, astonishing. I, I'm still not sure they've been uh, explained. The, the marriage altar was fascinating. Those two indentations certainly look like they've been made for two asses. I mean, they just looked exactly like it. And the Thunderbird. I mean, maybe Fell had been in there and done that the day before I got there, but it sure looked old. I was intrigued. Fell was absolutely beguiling. He really was good on his feet. And he made a terrible mistake in turning against the press. Me, it, was, it wasn't just me. It, it, I mean, you know, I, I would have given him a fair shake down the road, you know? I mean, what the heck? It was a great story. 
it's funny, last night I was looking at uh, uh, a, a, a reliable site on, 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 the, on the web and no, it, it was, it was the new, new Yorker. The new New Yorker says, a new study now cited that the most impactful work being done today by scientists is done by, is done by those outside their specialty. That's felt. I also found that in 1983, 96% of 340 teaching archaeologists had negative views of Fell's claim. I wish more Americans today would look at the whole side of issues, at both sides of stories, like I had to as a reporter. Don't just listen to what somebody says and take it as truth. Look at the other side. I, I draw near the close now, but here we go. So the years went by. And uh, I was the one people called many times when they wanted to find the sites and so forth, and I'd help them, you know. Sometime in the late 1980s, I was visiting North Shrewsbury. Pierce's store up there. The Pierce's were some of my best friends ever. And there was a fellow in town, and I can't remember his name. That's because I'm 82. And he was one of those guys who was, had a fascinating curiosity. And he had found in the Lamoille River some Indian pottery, extraordinarily rare. And so he was a guy who was always on the lookout. And one day he took me to uh, Jockey Hill. Does that mean anything to anybody here? OK. North Shrewsbury, right here. Road comes up, North uh, Shrewsbury, the road comes up to North Shrewsbury here. Pierce's store. This is the upper Coal River Road that goes over here. The Long Trail, Appalachian Trail, cross here. The Coal River runs down beside it, the trail. Right here is Clement Shelter. An overnight. Across the brook from Clement Shelter is a long ridge called Jockey Hill. Probably a mile long. Probably rises about 500 feet in elevation above the surrounding landscape. And if you look at Pico, Killington, and Shrewsbury from north, the New Shrewsbury area, you'll see that low long ridge in front of it. It's almost perfectly shaped. Well, this guy, and I can't remember his name, I guess he's not here in the audience, I think he would have uh, showed me at the southern, now, I'm telling you this because I want you to go there. <laughs> Went to the southern end of Jockey Hill, or that ridge, and there was a large stone up there, probably this high. It was a dolmen. I've seen them all over England. A stone set upon legs. And there was a stone under each corner. That was no accident. There is, unless it's been destroyed, and it's been 50 years since I've been up there, there is a dolmen on Jockey Hill, which to me says, there's a world of research still to be done. And I hope some of you will go up there and see. I, I'd like to know. Let me know. I'm in the Montpelier phone book, you know. Or go online, Howard Coffin Civil War, and you'll find me. I'd like to know if it's still visible there. It has to be. It's right on. It's too big to move. Barry Fell died in 1994. He was known for his primary research in sea urchins and starfish. Never really got you know, much credit for what he did in, 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 along my lines here. 
I will close with this. Years after the Castleton Conference and my travels with Fell, I was driving one night and I heard a report on a, the radio. I remember it was a rainy night. The report said that a Castleton State College professor named Warren Cook had reported to the state police that in the darkness his headlines picked up crossing Route 4 a Sasquatch, and I am right there. <laughs> That's it. <laughs>